subscribed, and I don't really need to say much more other than he's an awesome guy. Call him with a lot of thanks for because they like to hear the thank you. Just because you're in a blue district doesn't mean you need to do something, which is call and thank him for doing fighting the good fight. Mm -hmm. So without further ado. <laughs> Thank you, Linda and Bridget, and uh, the rest of this great swing left crowd. It's great to be with you, and uh, despite uh, Bridget telling you you don't need to write to me, I like it when you write to me, so please write to me. Send me postcards. Uh, keep in touch. I love it. And uh, thanks to the GO team and all the folks who've been working so hard in Tracy uh, to catch this blue wave and make the most of it here in the state of California. Uh, we have year after year, cycle after cycle, turn California bluer, uh, even when the, the national uh, tide went against us in a few of these elections. But we keep making progress here in the state of California. And I think 2018 is a year where you really don't want to be a Republican running for office in the state of California. Um, they've got a lot of explaining to do, uh, if you know what I mean. Uh, they have been supporting Donald Trump every step of the way on this terrible terrible agenda so uh, your work is so important and and i don't know if we can flip all 14 republican seats in california that might be asking too much but we're going to flip several of them uh, and this seat in tracy is is certainly a, a potential golden opportunity thanks for choosing a cool location here. <laughs> where are who are the owners here yeah yeah what's your name kiana tiana um, I didn't even know this place was here. And I walked in and it just has such a warm and wonderful, on a rainy day, the smell of the chai and the coffee and the baked goods. I'm going to come hang out here sometime. Yeah. So uh, great and, and good to be with all of you. Uh, I don't think I need to uh, underscore or elaborate on how important this election is. I mean, my God, it feels like our country is sort of hanging in the balance, our democracy. Uh, 242 years or something like that of representative self-governance. Uh, no exaggeration to say right now we're sort of at an existential moment for all of that. I don't know if any of you saw the tweet last night uh, from one of the most highly decorated veterans in the United States, uh, retired General Barry McCaffrey, uh, a, a man who's very uh, measured, very patriotic, not known for hyperbole or certainly not known for partisanship. And I, I believe his tweet went something like, reluctantly, I have concluded that Donald Trump uh, is a threat to our national security. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when you've got folks like that coming out and saying that here, here it is, our, the President of the United States, we cannot be sure that he's even making decisions without fear or favor when it comes to Russia and Vladimir Putin, and that's what Barry McCaffrey, no less, uh, concluded and said last night that he is under the influence of Vladimir Putin. That just should be troubling to every single one of us. He's obviously under the influence of the Koch brothers and the NRA and any number of other special interests that are also driving our national agenda in some terrible, unconscionable ways. So uh, we've got one heck of a moment here, but the good news is we're, we're starting to win a lot of these races. Obviously, uh, we won a big one this week in Pennsylvania 18. And uh, that victory in a Trump plus 20 district uh, just two years ago uh, is the latest indication that this wave that all of you uh, are helping us build and make the most of is very real. Uh, it's going to be, uh, it's going to put so many seats around the country in play. Pennsylvania 18 I mentioned, won by Trump plus 20. Um, we have over a hundred seats around the country with better numbers for Democrats than Pennsylvania 18. Nice. So we now need 23, folks, and a hundred look better than the one that we just won. Uh, so that's exciting. And, and of course the Republicans are in full denial and scramble mode. They're not quite sure what their message is after all of these losses and, and close shaves they keep having in deep Republican districts. Mm -hmm. This week they, they tried out a few uh, rationalizations. Uh, one of them was that, well, gosh, we're still five and one in special elections so far, um, right? Yeah. Well, every one of those special elections was in a deep red district. Mm -hmm. And if you just do the math and assume that, okay, five and one, Democrats are going to win 20% of deep red districts in this next election, that's pretty good for us. That gives us about 
a 42-seat majority in the next Congress. So uh, that's good math. Even Betsy DeVos could calculate that. Right? <laughs> Are you sure? Maybe not. All right. That, there I go. Hyperbole. Uh, the, the other uh, attempted spin they tried was that they just need to talk about their tax cuts more. Uh -huh. And, you know, they could not have talked about tax cuts more in Pennsylvania 18. I mean, they just went on and on about it, and they spent millions and millions of dollars, brought in every top surrogate, all the way up to Pence and Trump and Trump Jr. in a hairnet, of all things. I mean, they, they tried everything. Uh, and the tax cut message just did not work. So uh, it's exciting. And, and some people are trying to suggest, uh, you know, with all of this Democratic energy and momentum that there's some kind of a democratic civil war going on yeah. and it's emerging because Connor Lamb had said he won't support Nancy Pelosi as the next leader. Um, I don't think there's a democratic civil war right now. I think Democrats do really well when every part of our base from the progressive left to the moderates out there who suddenly are marching in the streets like they're Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman, uh, you know, when all of them are animated that's when the wave gets real big and Democrats do really well. Uh, and I think that, I, I believe that the driving energy behind that, um, in part, obviously, is a response to Donald Trump and just how terrible this guy is and what he's trying to do to our country. Uh, but I believe progressive ideas and progressive values are animating this in a big way. Um, that may not mean progressives get every single thing we want, uh, when we take back the House, but I think progressive ideas are on the rise, and, and I saw a great indication of that this week. Now, um, sometimes the progressive left likes to criticize this, this moderate think tank called uh, Third Way. Have you heard of Third Way? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, Third Way is, is a think tank, a democratic think tank, but a, a fairly moderate one, and they came out with, uh, you know, a, a fairly interesting blueprint, I, I don't remember exactly what they're calling it, but they're kind of suggesting this should be Democrats, and particularly the, the 2020 Democratic nominee, it should be like their contract with America. And I, I read it uh, expecting to see, you know, kind of moderate-ish, uh, compromise-oriented things on Democratic values. What I found instead was, holy cow, it's like the left has totally uh, influenced even the thinking of third way. They're talking about totally revamping the unemployment insurance system so that to reflect the, the more transient nature of the workforce. It used to be groups like this proposed like, well, let's, let's, do, um, let, let's, let's give up a few social security benefits. Let's talk about uh, lowering the retirement age and then make that part of a grand bargain compromise. None of their ideas are anything like that. It's all kind of leaning in in a very innovative and I found quite progressive way. So yet the latest indication to me that uh, progressive ideas have really penetrated the national debate. Uh, and I think we're more or less all together right now. I think that's a great thing. Yeah. And you know, we're gonna win some elections and what a great place to be able to um, debate with each other you know, how quickly we achieve single payer health care. Right? Yeah. So uh, I, I think we're on a great path here. Uh, it all depends, of course, on winning elections. And so all of these wonderful ideas and debates that we have and this energy, um, you know, it's, it's great, but winning really matters. And I suspect that all of you um, understand that much more keenly in the wake of 2016, mm -hmm. where we, we took winning for granted. I, I think all of us took winning for granted. The media took Hillary's winning for granted. Uh, and wow, uh, are we paying the price for that. So we won't make that mistake again. We know that it's all about getting out and working hard right to the finish. Uh, we're gonna do that. We don't yet know who our candidate is in the 10th Congressional District. We've got a number of Democrats running. Um, that's gonna be a little challenging for us as activists and volunteers and uh, campaign workers. Um, but we can all agree that we'd like to uh, take out Jeff Denham, right? So, uh, thank you. I think your work, uh, regardless of who emerges from the June primary in that district and other districts that I know you're working on, I know your work is going to set the foundation for some big wins here in California and around the country, and I thank you for that. Happy to answer a few questions uh, in the time we have together. Yeah. So did 
district priorities? Yeah. What are your district priorities? Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the issues and priorities that I'm working on day to day may not be super glamorous. Uh, the Smart Train has uh, about a twenty million dollar federal grant out there that the Trump administration has sort of held up inexplicably, uh, and and it's really frustrating because it seems even when it comes to just paying out grant funds that have already been awarded, and you know, the basics of choosing which projects get funded, it's all politics all the time. You know, they're, they're jerking around the folks in, in New Jersey and New York over a tunnel that had pre previously been promised for funding from the federal level, and all of a sudden they're like, wait a minute, these are rich blue states, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't do that. Uh, they're doing the same thing in California on a whole bunch of uh, important projects. They tried to take away the funding for the electrification of Caltrain on the peninsula, a, a project that really everybody supports, but it was in California, so we had to really fight, and I think we've gotten that back on track. This smart funding is really critical to complete the leg from San Rafael to Larkspur, uh, and it's under construction. Smart is extending its own funds, uh, and, and really in, in a fairly precarious place if, it, if the government doesn't honor that promise for that grant. So that's the kind of thing I'm working on day to day. Fire recovery is a big deal in this district. Uh, and fortunately, we've been able to secure the federal disaster funding at the, at the ratios that we needed. The city of Santa Rosa, if we didn't get those funding ratios, literally was gonna have to turn out the lights. They didn't have the money uh, if, this mon if this funding didn't come through. So working very hard on that. In the far north of my district, I've got all kinds of great issues I'm working on, removing some dams on the Klamath River to restore salmon. Uh, but as I, as I do all of these things for the district, I'm also fighting off a lot of bad things. I'm just playing an awful lot of defense these days. Um, so right now we're a few days away from the omnibus funding bill, and uh, this happens every time. The Republicans are just trying to sh uh, jam all of these toxic policy riders into it, and it's the usual stuff on Planned Parenthood and uh, you know, women's rights, uh, but it also includes some bad stuff on the environment and uh, on California water. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're cutting just about everything that we care about, uh, including Western drought resilience programs, water recycling, water <coughs> conservation. But out of the blue, they want to give $20 million to this one water storage project to raise the Shasta Dam uh, that would benefit this very wealthy Republican water district mm -hmm. uh, in Fresno. Uh, and this is a project that's illegal under the California Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. So this is the kind of thing this time of year when we get up close to these deadlines uh, that I uh, work long hours on and you often don't even read about it or see it, but it's kind of becoming a, an annual drill with this group. I can't wait to get the gavel back in Democratic hands. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, it, it, it's going to mean all of these terrible policy drills when we, when we just go to pass legislation to fund the government go away. Uh, we're not going to be constantly fighting off these toxic riders, and we'll be able to put good things in there. So what a difference it will make. It's not just who the Speaker of the House is, although that's really significant. It's not just you know the top three or four issues that you may care about. It's all of the issues that go before every single committee in the House of Representatives week after week after week, the setting of that agenda and the determination of what goes forward and gets voted on. It'll be a transformational change to get that gavel back in Democratic hands. Yeah. I'm Susan Morgan with Individual Brand. Uh, we got, sorry, Susan Morgan with Indivisible Moran. I'm sure you've seen the uh, race count study that came out recently. I would imagine. Which, which study? I'm sorry. It's the race count study. Actually, Marin scores the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. the worst in all kinds of issues regarding quality of life for people of color. And um, I'm just interested in your thoughts on this study and potential solutions. Well, so obviously, you know, Marin, wonderful, affluent, great quality of life, Marin. Uh, it has some challenges, and, and this study is highlighting one of them that we, we we got a lot of work left to do on affordable housing, on inclusion, on uh, our immigrant community, on the public housing that we have, whether it's Section 8 housing that there's not enough of, or whether it's uh, Marin, a place like Marin City, uh, where you've got some, some pretty terrible conditions that I have personally seen and I find totally unacceptable. So. What am I going to do about it? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I can be part of the solution on all of these things. 
Um, on the housing front, uh, we're actually plussing up the HUD numbers instead of uh, dropping them down where the president wanted them. I hope that translates to some better support for affordable housing and Section 8. Uh, veterans, VOSH vouchers as they call them, can help when it comes to veterans and trying to keep them out of homelessness. Um, I'm also supporting what uh, the County of Marin is trying to do on housing in Marin City, which is probably going to include um, some, some additional housing there as part of a rebuild. I think that's got to happen. And I know that there are historic structures that have to be honored. Uh, but if you see the conditions up close the way I have, it, it's not pretty. Uh, and I think they're trying to do the right thing. Uh, Louis Jordan, the head of, uh, of our housing uh, authority here in Marin, and I, I trust him and support the work he's trying to do there. On the immigrant issue, uh, we're obviously supporting the DREAM Act as sort of the most obvious piece of what we need right now uh, for the young folks, but also comprehensive immigration reform and you know, one of the high stake fights in this government funding bill right now, and, and this is gonna come down to the wire, is the Trump administration wants a whole bunch more money basically for a deportation force. They wanna load up on detention facilities and personnel and other things because they really wanna move inland and start rounding people up. Uh, and we're trying to push back on that. I will keep pushing back on that as well. So in the last few days, there were some reputable, uh, reputable people reporting an ICE presence in Nevada, and I know your office was looped in on that. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the outcome of that? I mean, is it verified? Uh, what we know is that ICE uh, did attempt to uh, enter a home in, in Hamilton. Uh, thankfully, the, and this is a, a good example of someone who knew their rights. Uh, there was no warrant. They did not let them in. So thankfully, who, you know, if there had been undocumented folks in that residence, uh, they were protected. Uh, ICE then went on and, and did detain a young man uh, in Novato, and that person is in custody. I don't have a lot of details because I haven't yet got, yet got the privacy waivers I need from the family to go to ICE and, and get more information. But I'm sure we'll be working with Canal Alliance and others to find out exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go here. I had read that or heard that you signed the articles of impeachment recently. Can yeah, that, it felt it? good. <laughs> <laughs> did it feel good for you? Yeah. 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 Uh, I did, and uh, you know, I would love to impeach this president. Uh, I'm, I'm very worried about this president. I, I hope I made that clear in, in my opening thoughts here. Uh, we're not anywhere close to impeachment, though. I've got to be honest with you. and, and some of you are old enough to remember Watergate and how painstakingly slow uh, the process was, but eventually there came a tipping point in Watergate and even Republicans started turning on Richard Nixon. I believe we will have that tipping point with Donald Trump, uh, but I think it, it's gonna have to run a little bit further. He's gonna hasten that tipping point if he keeps doing stuff like, uh, like firing McCabe uh, yesterday, which is just outrageous uh, for a president to reach down and do a political hit job on an FBI, a career FBI employee two days before he's gonna retire. Uh, it's so transparent, so heavy handed. Uh, there's an enormous backlash I think underway as a result of that. Uh, whether that goes the next step to include you know, Sessions, Rosenstein, these are the kind of things that I think could hasten the tipping point. And of course, you know, as we get closer to this election and Republicans begin to see um, what Mr. Saccone saw, that, that Trump is actually not uh, uh, an asset, but in fact is a huge liability for them, we may see more of them begin to part ways. But that, that's what it's going to take. And obviously winning a big election is maybe one of the biggest ways we can hasten that, that divide and, and get Republicans to have that reality check, realize that it's time to choose between our country and this, this crazy guy who's our president. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know uh, anything about the FCC and, and 5G, so uh, let's uh, let's cross that bridge uh, when we have a new majority, and, and we'll talk about it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm curious with healthcare reform, both at a state and federal level, whether you have reached out to any of the providers. We have some big mm -hmm. providers here 
in Northern California, like Sutter Health and Tracy, for example, and they are greatly impacted by any changes changes to funding, yeah. um, mm -hmm. particularly with their through their emergency room. And I've been I've hesitant. They, with leadership from you, maybe they'd be willing to talk a little bit more. Well, I, I think you raise a really good point. Healthcare. Uh, is our issue this, this year, right now. And, and in fact, from some of the exit polling I saw in Pennsylvania 18, and look, Connor Lamb, you, you can call him a moderate Democrat or whatever, he ran in support of the Affordable Care Act, in support of Social Security, Medicare, uh, and that resonated there. People don't want to see health care rolled back. And I have found over the past couple years, as they've been trying to uh, chip away at our progress on health care reform, that these providers, and especially the community health clinics, uh, are stepping forward as some of the best advocates we have in Republican districts. So to the extent that some of you have relationships with Sutter, with children's hospitals, with clinics uh, in uh, the 10th district or any other Republican district, these are going to be great allies to help folks understand that, you know, Jeff Denham, you know, he's, he's a uh, he's pretty amiable guy. I get along really well with Jeff Denham. The consequences of his votes uh, are life and death consequences for the people in his district. They have hurt the people in his district very badly. And if it had gone their way, if John McCain had done this instead of this, uh, it might have hurt many, many more of them. So uh, he needs to be accountable for those votes. And, and no matter how nice and amiable he may be, uh, he's hurting people in a, in a real serious way uh, by supporting Donald Trump in this terrible agenda. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, if uh, the recent things have uh, kind of quelled that movement or, or what you know about what's happening. Right. With that. So you're, you're referring to what we call concealed carry reciprocity. Mm -hmm. This was one of the NRA's top uh, uh, priorities for this Congress. Uh, the, the very first thing they did, interestingly, uh, in this Congress, literally in the first week, was to strip away uh, a protection for people to keep guns out of the hands of people who are so mentally ill that they need conservators, right? Uh, the, the Obama administration had done an executive order preventing people who were so lacking in mental capacity that they need a conservator from buying a gun. They undid that. They did an override. That was job number one for this Congress and this president, uh, which is pretty shameful. Uh, the next, one of the next priorities, there's two other big ones they had. Uh, one of them was to deregulate silencers. Right? Uh, so we, <laughs> it's just amazing the things that these guys want to do. Gun sales are kind of down uh, for the industry with Donald Trump in office. The, the paranoid, you know, gun-loving folks uh, aren't so paranoid that they're running in to buy guns anymore. And so they needed something to pump up gun sales, and they decided that uh, silencers would be a good thing, and they'll, they'll sell it in the name of hearing protection yeah. right? <laughs> for sportsmen. So they, they roll out this sportsman's bill that includes uh, the lifting of the restriction that we've had in place since the 1920s, maybe the 30s, on silencers. Uh, and it passed out of the House Natural Resources Committee. Guess who voted for that, by the way? Jeff Denham. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's pending on the House floor. There was a lot of blowback, and I think they began to realize just what a terrible idea this was. And then along came the Las Vegas shooting and more shootings, uh, and so it has stalled, but we've got to keep an eye on that. And then the other one uh, that has also been moving and is, is likewise on the House floor is this concealed carry reciprocity. It, it's the worst in some ways of all of these bad ideas because there are some states who make it very easy to get a concealed carry permit. Uh, you can get it as a teenager. Uh, you don't have to undergo any rigorous training or uh, much of a background check at all. And the way this law works is that if you could get a concealed carry permit in any state in the country, it would have to be honored in every state of the country. Uh, everywhere in the country. So, uh, good luck. State of California, city yeah. of San Rafael, trying to prevent you know some unhinged teenager with a concealed carry permit from walking into this coffee shop and exercising their right under this new law. It's a really bad piece of legislation. And, and again, I think there's been enough blowback that they have, they've at least slowed it down. But it's still there, and they're, they're still pushing it. In fact, at the, 
a televised meeting in the White House a couple weeks ago, uh, Steve Scalise, a friend of mine from Louisiana, tragically shot at baseball practice. Uh, he's pushing this, and he pushed it to the president, you know, with the cameras rolling just three weeks ago. So we, we got to keep an eye on that one. Mm -hmm. When are you having that, um, you're going to be talking with Emma? Yes. Tomorrow. Yeah, I, I believe it's at 10 a.m. at, uh, is it, 10, thank you. At Dominican, it's sold out. Uh, you, you can still uh, show up and try to get in. You know, we overbook these things like an airline, so you never know who, who doesn't show up. Uh, but we'll also have it uh, telecast, and I'll put it on my podcast, so you'll be able, if you can't make it tomorrow, you'll be able to listen to it. Uh, it's going to be great. We have student ambassadors from all over the North Bay, from all sorts of uh, middle schools and high schools that are going to participate in a conversation with advocates from some of the top gun reform groups and with this fantastic young woman from Parkland, Florida, Emma Gonzalez, oh, yeah. uh, who's just, like the rest of those kids, uh, been amazing. Wow. Yes, sir. So one of my frustrations is I, I hear what, you know, I like say the Republicans propose this and that, but I don't understand I don't have a chance to actually speak to someone and say, what is it you are trying to do or thinking about? So you have the opportunity to talk to Jeff Denham, for example, and when do you ask him, why are you voting against the ACA or for this silencer thing or something, when it doesn't make any sense to you, what does he say that seems to make sense to him? You know, I, I haven't had a chance to really probe uh, Jeff Denham's reasoning on uh, some of the votes that he has cast. Um, I have talked to a few of my other Republican friends. Some of them feel enormous pressure because uh, Republican politics has become a pretty unforgiving place, uh, particularly the Republican primaries. Uh, and their worst fear uh, is getting a primary from their right, sponsored by the Koch brothers or the Heritage Foundation or one of these other big dark money groups. Uh, so they feel like they have to constantly be looking over their right shoulder. And it's become very unpleasant for many of them. That's why some of the, the sensible Republicans that admire, I admire the most are leaving. There's a huge wave of retirements underway right now. And others, uh, sort of make what I believe is a, a very flawed decision. They think they can manage the situation. And how many people have we seen, you know, get into Trump's orbit and think that they can manage this guy or they can manage the, the, the wild populist wins? I, I, apologies to the word populist, right? Because this is something worse and different than just populism. But, um, you know, it's, it's depending on the individual, it's some, uh, combination of these things, thinking they can ride it out and it'll get better, thinking that the Trump thing will run its course and we'll get back to something more normal, or just living in fear of someone challenging them from the right. Uh, but they're not happy, I will tell you that. And, and that is significant because here we are, the Republicans control every branch of government. They haven't had it this good since, uh, what, the 1950s, probably, and they're absolutely miserable. So um, this is this is a, a moment for us, and uh, you know I, I don't I don't want to judge some of these folks too harshly. Uh, I, I accept that I'm going to have people I disagree with in politics. This is a big country; they come from places with very different perspectives and different politics. Um, but I, I think many of them, if we take back this majority, will be in some ways relieved. Uh, to have a chance to work with Democrats and to come back a little bit to to a more moderate place where they would like to be. Mm -hmm, Bridget? So when we take back the majority, yeah. not if, but when, um, do you guys have a plan for how you're going to roll back all of these disastrous <laughs> new policies and changes to establish policy? How do we uh, put Humpty Dumpty back together again? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we, we have a, uh, an agenda, uh, and it's familiar to many of you. It's, it's called, you know, like it or not, it's called a better deal. Uh, better I jobs. I like it, but yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Some like it, some don't. Uh, but look, it's, it's an economic message. 
That's the main thing about it. It's about jobs, it's about wages, it's about childcare, uh, and we're gonna push those things. Uh, but we've also got a lot of repair work to do. So, you know, can we roll back these, these tax cuts uh, and, and do something about the huge deficits and the reckoning that they have forced on our country? Uh, I don't know, it depends on whether we take the Senate, probably. Uh, but we certainly will have the power of the purse in one branch of Congress, and that's a big piece of leverage we don't have right now. So we'll just hold out. We, I think we can hold the line on any further um, undermining of the Affordable Care Act. I think we probably, with that leverage, can get the individual market stabilization that we need to keep the system from imploding. Uh, I'd like to go on offense on health care and do a lot more and do early buy-in to Medicare and eventually Medicare for all. Uh, we're going to need all branches of government for that to happen, obviously. So um, I think um, we will certainly have an important lever we don't have right now to begin to push back, to stop the damage on many of these things, but we're going to need to keep winning, I think, to fully undo a lot of the damage we've seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us in the behind the scenes how many, I'm, of course, I'm for Medicare for All, mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders bill, are there a lot of people that you talk to that are not coming out in writing who's supporting it, but in their heart or their conscience believe that this is the right thing to do? I don't know any Democrats who wouldn't tell you, you know, over a cup of chai 